Hello, this is Kevin Thompson. I'd like to welcome you all to the Davis McGrath LSC IP webinar series for September 5th, 2012. Uh, today's topic is online defamation. Uh, the recording and slides from today's webinar will be posted at our blog in the address on your screen, which is blog.davismcgrath.com forward slash webinars, where you can also sign up for our webinar mailing list. Uh, for those of you who need Illinois MCLE credit uh, for either the live webinar or for watching the recording, if you have never done so, please send your name and ARDC number to me. And especially for those watching the recording, you need to also tell me when you watched the webinar. Uh, our next webinar uh, is coming up on October 3rd, 2012, again from 12 to about 12.30 on the Red of Publicity. So today we're going to be going for about 30 minutes and cover uh, just what is defamation, uh, explain a little bit about defamation law, what is libel, what's slander, uh, what's per se defama uh, defamatory, what's per quote, uh, what happens if you are a public figure or uh, somebody's making a statement about a public figure, truth is a defense, uh, making a statement as opinion, talk about just general sample cases dealing with uh, defamation. And then we're going to get into the, the, the main topic, which is online versions of this, and talk about going after anonymous commentators. And um, in, in particular, we're going to go into uh, big depth on a, a case out of um, Illinois um, in the uh, first district, uh, Stone versus Paddock, which I was uh, tangentially involved with. So I uh, will talk about, about that case uh, for a good chunk of uh, the rest of the uh, webinar. So in general, what is defamation? Uh, the laws vary from state to state, uh, but generally what's required is got to be a publication that is made to someone other than the person who is defamed that contains the following, a, a false statement of fact that is understood as either A, being of and concerning the plaintiff, and B, tending to harm the reputation of that plaintiff. So again, it's a publication. It, it's got to be um, transmitted to someone other than the person who, who, who hears it and you know thinks it's insulting or, or something along those lines. It's got to be a false statement, and it has to be uh, understood as concerning that plaintiff and tending to harm the reputation. So those are the, the basic elements of, of what is def defamatory. Uh, people always talk about, you know, libel law, or, you know, somebody saying something is slanderous. And it should be noted that libel is published defamation. Uh, that could be uh, uh, printed in a book, uh, could be uh, published in a newspaper, or online. Could be a, a comment posted to a Yelp review, uh, could be, um, you know, any number of things. If it's uh, online, it's it's usually uh, published and therefore libelous. Uh, slander is spoken defamation. I suppose there could be online defamation, uh, which is defamatory in, in an audio podcast or, or other uh, form, but those also might be considered published. Um, but generally those are, are uh, like a slanderous speech or a slanderous um, you know, statement that's made to another, uh, perhaps uh, you know, over the phone or, or some other method of, of distribution. Now, there's a big difference between the types of statements that can be made. Um, something that is on its face or per se defamatory is uh, automatically uh, you know, found to be uh, defamatory and, uh, you know, can be liable for damages. Um, and what generally is required is the statement is not capable of an innocent construction. Um, we'll go into per se in a little more depth in a second, but per quote, just to explain, is additional information is required that would make the statement defamatory. So some examples of what would be per se is uh, charging someone with a crime or uh, having been indicted, uh, convicted, or, or punished for a crime. Um, another possibility is a statement that imputes the existence of infectious, contagious, or loathsome disease. Um, the next one is something that tends to uh, directly injure that person in respect to their um, office, profession, trade, or business by showing that they're either not qualified you know, because there's a particular characteristic that job requires and uh, you're making a claim that they don't have it or they could harm their ability to earn a living in their profession. And um, 
the last is uh, like a statement that uh, imputes impotence or, or want of chastity. Now, th those types of things are just mere examples. Um, you know, I think uh, you know every, every statement is is uh, you know weighed on its on its face, but but generally it's it's got to be be something that's immediately apparent uh, from its the statement that it's it's defamatory um, to be per se. Now, per quote. Uh, like I said, it requires extrinsic facts that would make the statement defamatory. Uh, a good example would be a, a birth announcement in the newspaper, uh, but they named the wrong mother. And, uh, you know, that person isn't married, and so it imputes chastity, uh, like a, a want of chastity, <laughs> as uh, the case uh, cases point out, um, you know, that they had this child uh, out of wedlock. And... Um, you know that would be per quote because it's not immediate on its face that it's it's defamatory. I mean, it's it's just a birth announcement. Um, but if, but since it lists the wrong mother and you know that mother is you know that person is is not married, you know that additional requirement additional information is required in order to make the statement defamatory. So um, again, if there's any questions, uh, you know, as we're going along, uh, please uh, feel free to raise your hand using the webinar software. And again, for those of you watching uh, the recording, uh, please feel to email or contact me through the information there. Now, statements about a public figure, uh, like someone who's actually, uh, like someone in elected office, or um, as we'll talk about uh, limited purpose public figures, uh, the statement must be made with actual malice in order to be defamatory. Now, a regular person, we only have to, to prove that the speaker was negligent, that uh, they were you know, cognizant of uh, you know, the statement being made uh, or uh, was uh, negligent in um, uh, trying to prove, um, negligent in making the statement, that they're, they're like re reckless disregard for the truth perhaps. Now, a public figure is someone who is actively sought in a given matter of public interest to inf influence the resolution of the matter. So that, that could be like an elected official or uh, what is more often the case, a limited purpose public figure that's related to a particular topic, event, or controversy. Now, um, you know, that could be someone uh, who is actively campaigning or um, uh, interjecting themselves in a particular uh, public interest or uh, could also be someone who does so involuntarily. Uh, you, you get the example of a, of a pilot uh, who, who lands his plane in the Hudson uh, safely, uh, could be an involuntary public figure for you know, purposes of, of discussion relating to, uh, to that. Um, and so um, you know, if somebody makes a statement later that, uh, you know, that that person you know, wasn't qualified to be a pilot, you know that that could be you know uh, defamatory, and um, uh, but if they were um, uh, whether or not that be per se, you know, defamatory would you know uh, you know would depend on you know the nature of the statement, obviously. Uh, but you know that that person could be an involuntary public figure for a general discussion of that topic. Now, truth, it's important to note, is a defense to defamation. And so if the person who makes a statement can prove that it's true, uh, then by all means, uh, you know, then, then it's not, not defamation. And truth is, is uh, I mean, there's some minor diff uh, cases dealing with this, but, but for the most part, truth is an absolute defense. But the important, the one thing that people say about, well, it was my opinion. Uh, you know, I didn't say something that was, that, you know, directly bad. I, you know, that was my opinion that was expressed there. And, you know, opinions can be non-defamatory. Uh, but merely couching a statement as an opinion, it, it's not enough to make it non-defamatory. Um, you know, example could be, um, you know, um, I really didn't like uh, that movie. Uh, or, you know, that uh, uh, director... You know, I, you know, I, I just don't don't think that movie was his best work. Um, you know that those are opinions. Now, if if you say something like, "Well, it's my opinion that uh, that Joe is a murderer," 
just because you couch that as an opinion doesn't make it less defamatory because you you've implied the um uh charging a person with a crime and you know just merely making that your opinion is is not enough uh to make it non defamatory uh so it's important uh to you know look at the context and it's important to look at um uh just what uh you know well, what exactly is it done? Is it immediately apparent um, that that somebody's making a statement, and you know merely trying to hide it as an opinion? And if that's the case, then um, uh, you you know could still be actionable. Uh, you see this a lot online. Um, you know people try to uh, couch uh, like a bad review of a restaurant, you know, as 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 pure subjective opinion. Um, but sometimes, you know, those those opinions uh, can cross the line and and, and become defamatory. Uh, you know, if 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 it truly uh, can can uh, be be easily viewed as as not not truly an opinion, just just using the words, it's my opinion, doesn't make it so. So, uh, back to the general definition of of a. Um, uh, something that's uh, defamatory, you know, requires it to be a fact, um, you know, that that's false, and it requires a statement that can be proven false. Now, uh, the, the, there's a great case uh, called Vogel versus Felice, uh, in which a, a person was accused of being a dumbass, and uh, the sta statement could not be proven false. Uh, that the person I mean, how do you prove someone is or is not a dumbass? Um, it's just more opinion, and uh, and so uh, although the person you know alleged the statement was defamatory, it wasn't the type of statement that that could be proven false. And so you know, as a result, uh, you know, it was uh, you know mere opinion. Um, and as uh, uh, we talked about a little bit before, uh, statements you know can be defamatory if they're merely in a comment or or some other um, you know portion like a, a re online review section, um, and um, you know th those statements can be made uh, and and it can be actionable. Uh, it's important to note that uh, the the website itself that that has it is likely going to be immune under Section 230 um, if if all the uh, the requirements of Section 230 uh, have been complied with, and uh, I don't really want to go into Section 230 too much in this discussion. But just generally, just note that there are particular requirements for maintaining Section 230 immunity if you're a website owner, and uh, you know those requirements must be um, you know complied with, or otherwise you 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 won't be eligible for that particular type of immunity. Now, uh, just generally talking about uh, some examples of, of uh, defamation, there's a, a, a really uh, interesting recent case that came out just this August from the Eastern District of Tennessee called Seaton versus TripAdvisor LLC. And uh, Seaton is the owner of a hotel in uh, Pigeon Forge, uh, Tennessee called the Grand Resort. And um, uh, was rated on TripAdvisor as part of their group of the 10 dirtiest hotels. Um, and so they sued, uh, claiming that that was a defamatory statement. Um, and in that case, the Eastern District of Tennessee ruled that, um, uh, that they called that statement uh, unverifiable rhetorical hyperbole. Uh, that, um, you know, neither the fact that uh, defendant numbered its, its opinions from 1 to 10 or supports its opinions with some sort of general data uh, would convert that opinion to an objective statement of fact. And... Um, so as a result, uh, the statement was non-defamatory. Uh, it was mere, mere, mere opinion that uh, these uh, these these ten uh, hotels were the ten dirtiest, and uh, that Seaton's hotel was the the, the worst of the lot. Um, again, it was merely an opinion. Um, and then there's a uh, a great uh, uh, sort of oldie but goodie uh, California Supreme Court case, uh, Barrett versus Rosenthal. Um, which uh, it's it's a good one to talk about um, because it was a, uh, there was an email that was sent uh, that was critical of doctors that opposed alternative medicine and that was recently re that was then reposted on a support group site um, 
than the doctors that were um, talked about in that uh, original email sued, alleging that the statements in the in the original email were defamatory, and that the person who posted them to the support group site uh, was liable for republishing uh, that defamatory statement. And uh, it, it's a great uh, case uh, dealing with the Section 230 immunity of, of the website operator uh, who merely reposted uh, the other person's statement. And um, uh, so under Section 230, um, the, the, re the reposter was not liable. And it's, a, it's an interesting case. Um, it, you can cert certainly see why, you know, tensions can be high, especially in... Um, you know, I mean, these, these doctors are, are people that oppose alternative medicine, uh, you know, that they, they try to expose what they call quackery, and, um, you know, somebody who was supportive of, of uh, alternative medicine was, um, you know, trying to harm the doctor's reputations, and, um, you know, so they were, you know, so, so certainly upset. Um, you know, the original, you know, email was, uh, was not that widely distributed uh, as much as, um, you know the posting on the website was, and so they certainly you know tried to you know get the the website to take that down, and um, the uh, you know so, so simply because uh, um, they didn't like it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the reposter was liable, and so um, you know section two thirty uh, provides immunity for the website operator for, as I said before providing that uh, you know it, it's complied with. And uh, there are particular requirements that we've talked about in prior webcasts that, um, again, I don't really want to go into today. So let's get into the main topic, uh, which is anonymous speech. Um, and uh, it happens a lot on the Internet uh, where, uh, you know, people make a comment uh, or a review or uh, some other statement uh, that uh, perhaps a business or an individual doesn't like. Um, and um, assuming that it's it's a defamatory type of statement, um, which is what we're talking about today, um, you know, assuming it meets those requirements, it's something that's either per se defamatory or uh, can be, you know, per quote. Um, they, um, you know, it's a statement concerning them, and uh, it's been published. Um, then, you know, you just sort of certainly have a, a cause of action against someone. But the question is, against who? How do you try to figure out who the speaker is? How do you figure out who uh, the the anonymous commentator is? And that certainly can be a process. Um, there is uh, certainly procedures uh, in Illinois state courts uh, for what we call pre-suit discovery. Uh, Illinois Supreme Court Rule 224 allows uh, pre-suit discovery in certain cases, and we'll be talking about that in more detail in the Stone case, because um, that's how that case proceeded. Um, but otherwise, if you're, uh, you know, alleging uh, violations of federal law, and you're not in Illinois state court, uh, you may need to file a John Doe suit, and uh, in which case then, uh, you know, the Illinois Supreme Court rule is not available to you. Uh, in which case, then you, you've got to convince a, a judge uh, to authorize uh, discovery to get. Uh, you know, perhaps uh, you may have a, a username on a particular website. In which case, you may, uh, you know, name what you know. You name uh, the website uh, and you know get them to try to turn over the information that they have about that person. Um, other types of, of information you may have is, is merely an IP address. You, you might know that this IP address uh, belongs to Comcast, and uh, this comment was, uh, you know, came from that IP address at this particular date and time. At which point, then uh, you might be able to convince uh, the judge to, you know, authorize uh, discovery on that. Um, and then the, the Stone versus Pata case is a it's a really good example of of um, you know, how these cases proceed in, in state court. So we'll turn to that now, unless somebody has any questions at this point. So Stone versus Paddock um, is a, a case uh, brought by uh, Lisa Stone as uh, the mother and next friend of Jed Stone, her son, versus uh, Paddock Publications, which is a, a paper, uh, for those of you who don't know, that uh, publishes in the, the northwest suburbs and particularly uh, covers uh, the area 
of uh, Buffalo Grove, in which case uh, there was a, a sort of contentious uh, local election going on in Buffalo Grove in which uh, Lisa Stone was a candidate. And in the newspaper coverage of, uh, of her election, um, there were some comments that were, you know, back and forth. Uh, one might, you know, call them political discussions. Um, some of them went a little far. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the comments were, were sarcastic and, and just, just generally very, very contentious. And at one point, um, Lisa Stone's son, Jed, uh, went into those uh, comments and started posting himself. Uh, again, it, he did so anonymously initially, um, but, uh, you know, he, he made some postings. And, uh, you know, it eventually came out during the course of the discussion that, you know, he was Jed Stone. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, basically uh, a flame war emerged in, in which they, uh, you know, made comments. Um, and, um she didn't like the statement that was made. Well, we'll talk about more in detail exactly the statement. Um, but uh, just procedurally, uh, the lower court uh, ruled that, uh, you know, the, the, the plaintiff has made a, 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 an allegation of defamation and the IP address of the commenter sh should be revealed. And uh, the John Doe and Paddock uh, appealed with the argument that uh, the, the lower court uh, did not apply the proper standard uh, for reviewing uh, whether or not, you know, an, an anonymous commentator, uh, especially something relating to political discussion, whether or not their information should be revealed. So, um, the, uh, it's, it's an interesting discussion. Um, uh, there's a, a, a case um, from a while back um, called the Maxson case uh, that, that governs uh, Rule 224 cases. Um, just uh, I, I said that we we're going to talk about this here, so I guess I should mention this. Um, Rule 24 specifically is entitled Discovery Before Suit to Identify Responsible Persons and Entities. and allows pre-suit discovery when you um, ish, uh, file a verified petition in the circuit court uh, where the action might be brought, uh, you know, it's it's a verified petition. It's not a complaint, and then it uh, it sets forth uh, as much information as you have, and it explains the reason that the proposed discovery is necessary, and you know the nature of that discovery, and uh, asks the court to issue an order authorizing the petitioner to get that discovery, um, and so. Uh, the decision is, uh, you know, so how do you know, uh, you know, that the pros proposed discovery is truly necessary? And uh, there's this case called Maxson, uh, which uh, requires that the um, uh, that that the uh, the plaintiff um, make a petition that can survive a motion to dismiss. Uh, there are cases out of other jurisdictions. Uh, which have a higher standard, and that is what uh, the, the the John Doe in this particular case was um, was trying to get the court to rely on. There's a case called Mobilisa uh, out of the um, Arizona courts from 2007, in which uh, the, the, essentially, uh, you know, to authorize this type of discovery, uh, they had to have a, a motion. Uh, the, the petition had to survive a, a motion for summary judgment, which is a higher standard. Um, and in this case, um, you know, the court looks through and, and uh, rules for the first time for the first district, because uh, Maxson is a third district case, um, that uh, the, um, the motion to dismiss standard provides a sufficient uh, protection for the, the, the commentator um, because, uh, you know, as, I, as you may know, Illinois is a fact-pleading jurisdiction, and so the plaintiff had to allege in their complaint, uh, their, their, their verified petition, um, facts. And the, the, these facts had to be more than just mere conclusions and, uh, you know, could uh, survive a motion to dismiss. And so... Um, that, that leads to a discussion then of, you know, whether or not the statement was defamatory. So now I can tell you exactly what happened. Um, 
um, Jed at one point uh, had uh, you know essentially in, in a discussion of this political uh, political discussion going back and forth uh, told the commentator to identify himself and uh, quote navigate your way over to the stone confines uh, to have continue that discussion you know, he didn't want to continue that discussion uh, online you know he wanted to uh, essentially uh, turn it over to uh, uh, real world um, discussion and uh, the next day the uh, commentator wrote back um, essentially thanks for the invitation to visit you but I'll have to decline seems like you're willing very willing to invite a man you only know from the internet over to your house have you done it before or do they usually invite you over to their house and so they said that that's a defamatory statement because it implies that uh, Jed uh, invites strange men over to his home and um, you know it implies a, a sexual connotation to it which is the the statement that, that Lisa made um, you know the court and it analyzes the uh, the statement and um, says that um, it it's not per se defamatory uh, because it doesn't immediately uh, on its face you know have the the sexual connotation to it um, it's uh, it's it, it's taken from a general context of a, of a, discuss, a political discussion, and so it could be innocently construed to mean uh, that uh, Jed, you know, has he done this before? Has he, has he, um, he invited strange men over to his house for political discussions, um, or do these these strange men invite them over to his house, over to their houses, uh, for to continue these political discussions? And um, and so the statements were capable of that innocent construction, so they were not per se defamatory. And since um, that they were that, and, uh, and uh, were not um, otherwise actionable, uh, the, the plaintiff failed to to meet uh, the the motion to dismiss standard um, uh, because um, you know their 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 uh, allegations couldn't survive a motion to dismiss. And as a result, um, you know, the discovery was not allowed to proceed. And so there's the site for the decision, uh, 211 ELAP 1st, 093386, came out November 17th, 2011. Uh, as I mentioned before, I was tangentially involved in the case. I uh, helped uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation and uh, another advocacy group uh, to file a um, uh, amicus brief in support of the John Doe. Uh, trying to get uh, the, the the court to a analyze it according to the proper standard, because the, the lower court had uh, authorized discovery too easily, and so um, that that's how I was involved. And um, you know, I don't you know d didn't represent the Doe directly, and um, you know, otherwise don't know any more salient details than anyone else. So uh, I, I can't really talk to you know the the, the true details, but uh, I, you know, I can talk a little bit more about that, uh, and um, you know, so the the, the decision um, I don't think uh, goes as far as uh, those advocacy groups would have liked, uh, but it it certainly does um, you know help set um, the, the standard here, and I think the important lesson to be taken from this case when you're dealing with online defamation, and especially when you're trying to identify uh, you know that the, the um, uh, th these online uh, commentators, and you're trying to get somebody unmasked. Uh, you know, this is the case to follow uh, to show uh, you know the the merits and uh, the strengths of your case uh, when when you make it. You you've got to uh, make a sufficient allegation in your verified petition if you're going under Rule 24, 224, or if you're making a, a complaint in federal court. Um, you know, your your statement. Uh, you know, your statement of facts has to be strong enough to survive at least the motion to dismiss. So um, it's not going to allow mere fishing expeditions to uh, try to bully people, uh, you know, to get their identity revealed, um, you know, unnecessarily. Um, you know, we as a, as a society value uh, anonymous speech, uh, and so, you know, that an anonymity will not be uh, removed unnecessarily. Uh, you got to make a good faith effort and a, a good a good faith complaint 
uh, to uh, to get somebody unmasked. And so um, that's the lesson that I personally take out of this case, and uh, you know can be applied to multiple contexts. Um, you know, ranging. Um, you know, online defamation is so fact specific; it's, it's hard to go into. You know, other you know direct examples, um, but uh, you know. Uh, so, so there's certainly, if if anybody uh, you know has uh, further questions and they they don't want to raise them in the online forum, uh, please feel free to contact me. So I suppose this is a good point to say if anybody has any questions uh, and you wanted to uh, ask them using the uh, software, uh, please do so. Um, otherwise, uh, again, if you're watching the recording and uh, you would like to ask a question, uh, please feel to contact me from the email address or the phone number that's shown on the screen. So we'll pause for a second here to see whether or not anybody has any questions. Well, I'm not seeing anybody's hand raised at this particular moment, so I'm going to presume that means there's no questions. So I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, as a reminder, uh, our next webinar is coming up on October 3rd on the topic of the right of publicity. And uh, uh, again, uh, for those of you who need Illinois MCLE credit uh, for either the, the live webinar or the uh, watching the recording. If you haven't already done so, please provide me with your name and ARDC number. And uh, for those watching the recording, I need to know when you watch the recording. And um, I'd like to wish you all a pleasant day.